Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Later in the show, we'll preview a documentary based on the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, and tell you the story behind how a museum in Uzbekistan has been home to 20th century Russian avant-garde art. But first... We take you to Lisbon to see a doll hospital, considered the world's oldest of its kind, still in operation. Creating a library, we take a look into the future library project, which will be complete in 2114. And we'll take you inside a Syrian painter's solo exhibit in Istanbul. In 2014, Scottish artist Katie Patterson started a project in Norway. 1,000 trees were planted just outside of Oslo for a very specific mission in mind. The goal is to create the future library out of the trees planted in the forest 100 years from now. Every year, a writer contributes an unpublished, unread manuscript to the collection which will be held in trust. Canadian novelist and poet Margaret Atwood was the first to contribute to the project, followed by British novelist David Mitchell. In 2114, the trees will be cut down and turned into paper, on which these 100 unread works will be published. And only those alive at the time will have the chance to read what comes out of this forest. Artist Katie Patterson describes the future library as a living, breathing, organic artwork unfolding over literally a century. And she joins us now from Edinburgh to talk more about the project. Thank you so much for being with us today, Katie, on Showcase. Now, tell me about where this initiative initially came from. How did you come up with the idea of creating a project like this? The idea came several years ago, actually, even before we launched the project. And I was drawing tree rings um, in a book and I made a very fast visual connection uh, between tree rings and chapters in a book and imagined a forest growing over long, slow time and kind of capturing author's words um, and that that forest would then become a book in, in a century's time. So it, it, it came from a really small uh, doodle in, in a sketchbook and then took years to, to realise and, and now we're in year five already. Wow, who would imagine? Now, the first author to contribute to this project was is Margaret Atwood uh, that penned a book for it. Uh, how do you pick and choose the authors or do they just volunteer themselves? We have a committee, the Future Library Trust, and we get together um, and, we, and we make a short list, a long list of the authors, and then we personally invite them uh, to write for the Future Library. So we do that just every year. Uh, so it's quite fresh. It's not kind of lining up the authors, but it's selecting somebody who uh, has made an outstanding contribution to literature, um, but also is saying something very much of this moment, whether the year is right now or it's in the year 2055 or 2099. Um, so two of the, the words that we think about are imagination and time when we, when we select the authors and, and we send them a, a personal letter. Wow. And their books are actually placed within the silent room. Tell me about this silent room. Yeah, exactly. So, so the authors bring the manuscripts themselves to the forest um, and the, there's a small gathering. They hand over the manuscript and currently it goes away to the city archive in Oslo. Um, however, we're building a silent room um, in Oslo in the new library that will open in 2020. Um, and it's going to hold every single one of the hundred manuscripts over time. So it's, it's going to be a small space, but it's built using the wood uh, that we felled from the forest to make space for the new trees. Um, and it's going to light up year by year um, as the author's manuscripts go inside the drawer. So it'll be quite a meditative space. Anybody can visit. All they'll see is the author's name and the year. Uh, lit up on the drawers, but they'll be able to imagine the rest themselves. It is in and of itself uh, an artwork on its own. 
uh, if I must say correct, seeing as it from an artist's perspective, uh, creating yeah. it as an artist yourself, uh, you really wanted to get that installation vibe in there, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's probably going to be blackened wood. It's built in rows of um, 100 layers of, of wood itself. Um, we're designing it carefully with the architects of the new library, with designers. Um, and so it's it's also going to be made to last 100 years because literally everything we we think about with this project has to last for beyond our lifespans so everything down to the kind of lighting we use uh, you know we have to get experts on, bo uh, on board to advise what kind of lights to use that are going to last 100 years and but ultimately the feeling of the space is the most important the atmosphere that it creates um, and that it's locking away these texts that will both be secure but also they'll be kind of together in this room um, that in 100 years time when the manuscripts are all taken out um, the book will be printed at that point. Wow. Um, now these books are, as we said, they're set to be read 100 years from now or, or 2114 to be exact. Um, but looking at our day and age with technology being so implemented into our daily lives, do you think that handheld printed books are going to be a thing of the past by the time we get to 2114? I, I think it's it's so difficult to know. On the one hand, the printed book is like one of the most fundamental things um, and it's carried through time and, and no doubt it'll carry forward through time as well. However, the speed of technology just progresses and progresses. And I think for me, I think it's what we can't imagine right now. Um, and so there might be a way of reading that's that, that's there in 2114 that we just can't even predict, you know, that's something that's totally unimaginable right now. Saying that, hopefully the printed book still will exist and, you know, we're doing what we can, of course, to, to preserve that by planting the actual trees to, to make the book in that time. All right, Katie Patterson, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase and uh, creating this project You're for welcome. the future generations to come. Thank you so much. There is no illness that skillful surgeons cannot handle, from serious injuries like broken arms or legs to hair loss or even skin problems. They have seen it all and have been treating it all since the 19th century. But this very special hospital in the heart of Lisbon we're about to visit isn't any typical hospital that ordinary people like you and I get treated at. Take a look. This is a delicate procedure. The patient has been brought in with multiple traumas, but Dr. Manuela Cotolero has spent 30 years performing this kind of surgery. Welcome to Lisbon's Dahl Hospital, considered the oldest of its kind in the world. The hospital has been running in the same location by the same family since 1830s. I'm the fifth generation. It's our mission to take care of all these girls here. It all starts downstairs, when patients are brought in for a screening process. We assess what is wrong with the doll and make a file, like an entry card for a hospital. Afterwards, they are brought upstairs, and depending on the illness, they are forwarded into a specific ward. We have the plastic surgery room and the room for multiple trauma care. Here we have the names of the patients that are currently in treatment. Two, four, six, eight, ten to twelve are here now. One of the most common types of surgery we do is eye surgery. I think kids find it very amusing to push their fingers into a doll's eyes. That's why we have a lot of boxes full of eyes in never-ending colors, shapes and sizes. The hospital also has an infinite number of drawers packed with limbs and other body parts. A lot of time, especially with newer dolls, it's more economic to replace a broken arm or a broken leg than to restore it. Dr. Catalero doesn't keep track of how many surgeries are performed in the doll hospital on a daily basis, but taking a look at how full the room of discharged patients is, it's obvious things can get quite busy. 
This one came all the way from Brazil. She's waiting for the honors to come back to Portugal to take her home. A lot of foreigners make their way to the doll hospital because, believe it or not, they can't find this service where they live. We have visitors of all ages and from all social classes, grown-ups, old people, even older than me, and children. People bring their antique dolls or religious images, which are even older than some dolls. Sitting on these shelves are patients waiting for surgery. They were made with paper mache in the 1930s or 40s, and it's fun to read the news written on the paper they're made of and get to know the places they're from. For example, this one's from Spain. And sometimes a returning doll, I mean patient, comes back for a second or even a third treatment. Each number on the doll's feet corresponds to a date when they've been hospitalized. This doll was treated here before. The woman who took care of her died 30 years ago. I recognize her handwriting, but now the doll has to be treated again. She has cracks in her head, a common problem of aging. Just like we have wrinkles, they have cracks. Catalero doesn't remember when and why the jokes using authentic hospital terminology began. She suspects it has something to do with the real hospital that used to stand in the very same place the doll hospital now is, back in the 18th century. You can see on the floor this inscription for the old hospital chapel. Maybe that's why people started to call us a hospital, as we brought dolls back to life. The hospital has received a lot of donations during the past 200 years and has amassed a huge collection of about 5,000 toys. We don't like to call ourselves a museum. We like to say we are a big playroom because museums are full of valuable pieces. But this is not our concept here. In this hospital, we welcome everyone, from the most humble to the most important doll. And it's likely future generations will keep this family-run business up and running for years to come. One of my daughters works with me, so for us it's not a sacrifice. It's our family mission, and we love every moment of it. The Syrian war has left countless victims. While many, both young and old, have escaped, the memories of war and strife will be etched into their minds forever. A new art exhibit in Istanbul hopes to paint the picture about the impact the effects war have on children. We sent Adel Halim to check it out. It's a rare moment to smile for Ibrahim al Hassoun. I'm finding new ways to express myself and deliver a message in a visual way. al Hasun has lived in Turkey for the past four years and has been experimenting with a new painting technique. The 46-year-old says he decided to paint Syrian children for this exhibit because they are the most vulnerable to the effects of war and considers his artwork a call to action. This exhibition is a humanitarian message to the world. These children may carry hatred towards the world if the world continues to turn a blind eye to their struggle, if we don't give them back their childhood and care that they deserve. The results will be catastrophic. He says these artworks were born from seeing so many Syrian children who lost their parents, their homes, and their right to a decent education. I left Syria because I was afraid for my children. My house was bombed. I lost everything. I lost my house. I lost my workshop. I lost my relatives. So I took my children and I fled because I was afraid for them. I wanted them to have a good education, a good health care, and grow up to be good people. Turkey hosts more than 3.5 million Syrian refugees, more than any other country in the world. More than 600,000 of them are children now enrolled in schools across the republic. Ibrahim's pictures have evolved in terms of themes and colors in the last four years since we first began working together. This exhibition is centered around the war and children, as the name Childhood on the Sidewalk suggests. 
Yazidji believes Turkish audiences can learn a lot about the war going on next door by getting to know the Syrian artists now living on this side of the border. The colors in the pictures are sometimes bright and sometimes dark as they are inspired by the pessimism of the war. Some paintings lack color and this is natural. The artist is documenting his time like so many artists before him. And she says she would like to showcase more uplifting depictions of Syria, but that's just not possible at the moment. Of course, the artists from these parts should represent this utter devastation. I wish we could have more positive paintings, but God willing, we pray to see those days as well. The Childhood on the Sidewalk exhibit is open until November 25th. Adil Halim, TRT World, Istanbul. Still to come on Showcase, a preview of the Queen of Soul. A documentary on Aretha Franklin finally sees the light of day. And we head to the almost forgotten city in Uzbekistan, where a museum plays a vital role in understanding the history of modern art. But before we bring you those, let's take a look at some other highlights from the world of the arts and culture. We need more blue. Everybody check in. Tech team, Lego team, paint team. Now we need to involve some friends. Stranger Things star Millie Bobby Brown is now the youngest ever Goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. The 14-year-old actor's appointment was announced on World Children's Day. A new video by UNICEF revealed Brown's first task as a Goodwill ambassador. In the video, Brown is joined by her counterparts, including Orlando Bloom and Liam Neeson, and calls on everyone to go blue in support of Children's Day. The Statue of Liberty's original torch has been moved to its new home in the Statue of Liberty Museum. A replica replaced the torch in 1984 after deteriorating beyond repair. The new museum will open in May next year and also include three gallery spaces teaching visitors the history of Lady Liberty. And moving on to Qatar now, a series of sculptures by the British contemporary artist Damien Hirst has been unveiled outside a hospital in Doha. The installation is called The Miraculous Journey and comprises 14 bronze sculptures showing the stages of a fetus growing in the womb, which culminates with a 14-meter statue of a just-born baby. The work is part of the art collection of the Sidra Medical and Research Center, an $8 billion worth hospital funded by the Qatar government, and is possibly the largest collection of art at any medical facility anywhere in the world that includes artworks from British artist Tracy Emin, Tunisian artist Abdullah Akar, and Korean artist Ren Wang. The iconic gospel record Amazing Grace was Aretha Franklin's best-selling album, but the 1972 recording was actually shot as a documentary that never made it to the big screen. The film was shelved over technical glitches that couldn't be fixed until now. Three months after her death, Franklin's performance is hitting movie theaters, but what's being treated as an homage would have probably not been received as a blessing from the Queen of Soul. The choir at New Temple Missionary Baptist Church warms up with the voice of a 29-year-old Aretha Franklin. The two-night concert was documented by Oscar-winning director Sidney Pollack. But she's just basically standing there singing, giving her all, <laughs> doing what she does best. But the film was buried because the video and audio couldn't be synced. Fast forward to 2008 and producer Alan Elliott made it his personal mission to rescue the movie. She wanted to be a movie star and this was going to be her moment. And that, to me, is part of the reason why she was probably very frustrated, was she had 13, record, 13 number one records in a row. She was there with her producers, with her band, with that choir, and they had those cameras, and they messed it up. 
It took Elliot nearly two years, and when he wanted to release the film in 2011, the only person standing in the way was Aretha Franklin herself. She sued Elliot, saying he had used her likeness without permission. Once again, the film went back on the shelf until Franklin's death last August. Ellen called me out of the blue and he told me about the film. I had never even heard about it. And he sent me the link and I watched it. I was like, oh wow, this is really good. A sentiment expressed on the faces of the enthusiastic congregation, replete with the Rolling Stones frontman Mick Jagger. And while Franklin might not receive a royalty check, the film pays a serious homage to her greatness in the 1970s and the memory we have of her today. During the Soviet rule, Joseph Stalin imposed a ban on art that did not support the government's agenda. Artists who did not abide paid with their lives while the existing artworks were destroyed. During this time, a penniless artist daringly created the only forbidden art museum funded by the Soviets. Pretending to buy state-approved art, he rescued 40,000 works of fellow artists far away from the watchful eyes of the KGB. But now, the museum is hoping to attract more visitors to help keep the legacy going. Located in a city called Nukas in Uzbekistan, a museum houses the rarest and the second largest collection of Russian avant-garde work from the beginning of the 20th century in the world. But with limited resources, now the concern is how long can they hold on to these works of art? But what makes this museum extraordinary isn't just what it contains, but the story behind how it came to be. Opened in 1966 and named after its founder, artist Igor Savitsky, he single-handedly searched for banned artwork that could be saved from destruction and moved the artworks out to Nukas. Savitsky's approach to finding artwork for the museum was also opposite to most. This is the traditional approach to art. The artists need to be well-known, need to be accepted, and very rarely uh, some uh, unknown artists are taken to the collections. Savitsky's approach was quite opposite. What he thought to be real art was taken to the museum. He was uh, lucky no one controlled in, uh, him. I'm interested in what you saw there. Thousands of pieces. With the museum's acquisitions eventually playing out more like this Hollywood movie, which is about a team assembled to save any artwork from falling into the Nazis' hands. You can wipe out an entire generation, you can burn their homes to the ground, and somehow they'll still find their way back. But if you destroy their history, you destroy their achievements, then it's as if they never existed. And explored further in this documentary, it's still a surprise to many, as Savitsky's story is not widely known. These were forbidden works by artists who stayed true to their vision at a terrible cost. But many ask, why Nukas? Well, Savitsky had come to the city on an archaeological expedition, tracing the roots of the Karakalpak people. He got on so well with them, they saw his enthusiasm and desire to preserve a part of their cultural heritage. They helped him get funding to build a museum. In turn, they also turned a blind eye to his collecting of banned paintings, which years later are also on display in the museum. Thanks to the museum, Nukas has become a place of interest on a global scale, with people coming from around the world to see the paintings in person. I think it's a very impressive museum and it's a very surprising museum in such a remote uh, part of the, of, of the world, really. And uh, it's, it's the real, this museum is the reason why we came to Nukas. Uh, if, if there was no museum here, we would not have come to Nukas itself. So, uh, very important. But despite the enormous effort to collect all these pieces in one place, many of them are under threat. There aren't adequate facilities to store or maintain many of the collection's 90,000 pieces, with some in need of repair. 
run mainly on membership fees and donations, the funds just aren't there to do that. And with outside organisations offering to take vulnerable pieces off the museum's hands, the question these days is, how long can a museum that spent a lifetime amassing such a priceless collection hold on to it? And with that, we wrap up this edition of Showcase. But make sure to visit our YouTube channel to check out more of our coverage of the global art scene. From me, Efnan Han, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching and see you next time.